Greetings, this is Griff Ruby, the Nostalgia Catholic, with the very third story that Isaac Asimov would write as a science fiction story, and that would see print. And furthermore, his very first one to appear on the pages of his much beloved astounding science fiction. So there it is. That's pretty astounding. See, it says science fiction. 20 cents, July 1939. So this is it right here. It all started with this magazine. As far as, see, from when he started writing in 1937, and then started making visits to the offices of Astounding Science Fiction, which he could just take a subway and basically get to within a, you know, and back home again within a day from his home there where his family lived. And he was a teenager, 17, 18 years old, and so forth. And he would visit um, John W. Campbell of Astounding Science Fiction. And he was trying to write stories. He showed Campbell his cosmic corkscrew, and, and uh, Campbell, you know, basically tore it apart. But uh, he did it in a way that was very, very constructive and helped him try to learn what he should do to try to make a story that Campbell would one day be able to take. So he kept writing stories, he kept trying, he got closer and closer, and finally, in uh, December of 1938, he had written a story called Ad Aspera Per, Ad, Ad Astra per Aspera, from Through the Struggles to the Stars. And in January of 1939, uh, John Campbell wanted him to come in and... Um, go over the story a little bit, a few pointers, a few things, because he had now finally written something that was interesting, that was well enough written to be worth putting in Astounding, and worth introducing Isaac Asimov as a new writer for Astounding Science Fiction. And generally speaking, the July 1939 Astounding is often taken as the beginning of the uh, golden age of science fiction. Well, at least the first golden age is any number of golden ages. So, this story, though, when it finally saw print in the July 1939, which would have actually been available sometime in June, um, issue of Astounding, it had been retitled Trends. And it gets no attention on the cover Obviously, I mean, here's the cover, you see, the, the picture is for uh, the Black Destroyer by A.E. Van Vogt, and um, the only other writers mentioned in here on the edge are Lester Del Rey and Ray Cummings, so, so his, his story is not mentioned on the cover, and obviously not portrayed there. It is, however, mentioned in the um, Fable of Contents. Wherein you see trends, Magic Asimov, and a little bit of page number, and a small blurb. Um, let me read the blurb right now, and it says, it's on page 33, okay. It may not be mechanical fault that stop men from reaching the skies. It may be human trends. So, huh, interesting little touch here. So there's the table of contents. Look at that. Inside, there's a little bit of color printing, at least on some pages, on the inside. So that's pretty cool. Now, page 33, it talks about, or mentions this. There it is. Trends by Isaac Asimov. And there's a huge scene. This is a scene from a very critical high point of the story in which a moon rocket explodes and there is a crowd of people here who foolishly insisted on being close enough to, you know, well, too close. And even the police, you know, they said, look, you guys need to stand back. I mean, this thing's going to take off and even if all had gone well, there would have been, um, you want to be a good distance away, not 10, 20 feet, but like, at least hundreds of feet away, maybe even a thousand or more feet away. And instead, they're standing maybe 20, 30 feet away from this thing. 
where they would be certain to be hit at least with the blast. And then when you take in the fact that due to sabotage, which I will get to later on here, it will in fact explode rather than take off, people got killed. Well, in the story, thankfully not actual people, but people got killed and many more injured because he just stubbornly stood too close. And the guy who launched this thing, who prepared this thing, he had warned everybody, stand back, get way, way back. This is dangerous. They ignored him. The police ignored him. A policeman said, oh, don't worry about it. Never mind what he said. You guys just stay where you like. It doesn't matter. He would probably have been seriously uh, pursued legally, except he is among the deceased. So I guess that lets him out. On the next page begins the story itself proper. Along with a splendid little blurb here. And again by Isaac Asimov and the illustrated by Orban. The blurb reads, a new author. That's right, we're introducing a new author here. A new author presents a new type of obstacle that may face the first rocket ship's inventor. The minds of men did not always run as they do now. Mm. Okay. Now, this story was, while well, it was a big threshold for him to pass getting into astounding science fiction, um, overall, it's not one of the more significant stories he has written. It has therefore only been gathered up into the early Asimov, where he tells some of the story about how and when that story came to be written and published and so forth, and along with a complete text of it, which Apart from the fact that there's no artwork and no blurbs, um, seems to be essentially identical. I, 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 there don't, I didn't find any differences worth commenting on, if indeed there's any at all. So, but let's look at some of the things that go on here. Um, now, one thing that emerges rather clear in this whole thing is that Isaac Asimov never really understood religious faith. I, he just didn't comprehend it. I, I think what it was is to him, well, um, you do evil things and God will get you for that. And maybe in the afterlife or maybe in this life by punishing you in some way or in the afterlife or something. Or if you do right things will be rewarded with bliss, blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, to him, that seems to have as much meaning as, well, if you step on a crack, you'll break your mother's back kind of superstition, childish superstition. To him, that's it all came across to that. And I don't think he ever lost that attitude, even as he goes on to write a rather fascinating volume about the uh, Asimov's Guide to the Bible, where he devotes a huge chunk to the Old Testament, being Jewish, that makes a lot of sense, and then another chunk to the New Testament. So, which is a little bit of a surprise, but I, I, okay. Anyway, I think it's kind of fun to have those things, and they make interesting reading. And yet in all of that, the actual core of what religious faith itself is all about, which is, of course, you know, the underlying purpose to the whole Bible, just doesn't seem to receive, you know, just never receives any attention. It's like his, his opinion of it never got above this, childish well that's just on par with a step down a crack breaking your mother back level so one of the things he decides to have the religion do is say oh we don't want to go in space god will get you for that you know penetrating the skies of the heavens you'll invoke the wrath of god you know and even weirder, literally every religion on the face of the earth signs up to that. Didn't matter. Protestant, Catholic, Jew, Buddhist, you name it, they all held hands in ecumenical fervor and said together, don't go above the earth's atmosphere, you'll call down the judgment of God. They won't even faintly reveal familiar with, you know, actual religions would know. 
that 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 is that is physically impossible. I mean, you can't even get all the religions in the world to agree that murder is a bad thing. You know, so <laughs> and and point of fact, there is no known religion then, any other time or now, that would have looked upon going into outer space as some kind of a sin or something, you know? You might as well say it's a sin to go across the ocean and, oh look, we found some more continents out there. Isn't that interesting? So, now it is a fair question though, and I'd like to get into this before I get to the story itself. Can a religion object to some sort of scientific progress? If you want to call it progress, at least. And I'd have to say, actually, though, I have to admit it can. But where this happens is where there is a moral or ethical consideration. I.e., I think you would be hard-pressed to find very many religions, if any, that would support the idea of... Um, scientific research based on torture. I mean, the Nazis were doing all kinds of stuff, you know, to explore what happens if you do this and that. The Japanese in building 731, which they set up in the China that they were invading at the time, you see, were just, I mean, they even made the Nazis look mild, which is, that takes some doing, you know? And I don't know that there's any you know, serious religion on the face of the earth that could ever say, yes, this is great, you know, science should be able to progress even at the cost of these heinous uh, experiments that really seem to have more to do with looking for creative ways to torture people than with anything useful for, well, anything uh, whatsoever. So, yeah, there are ethical considerations. Is there an ethical consideration about going into space? No. Indeed, it's like, the, you know, is there an ethical consideration about just flying in a balloon, in an airplane? You know, oh yeah, you could find a time when people would say, if man were meant to fly, he'd have wings. But this was not about, and if a man does, he's going to be damned to hell for it. It's, uh, it'll never work. It'll never work. He'll never fly. We're not gonna, we don't have wings. We're not meant to fly. You can try. You will fail. Um, and who knows how many tower jumpers did exactly that. They build some wings, they get into a high place, a tower, a cliff, they jump off and they hope they can flap their way down safely. And of course they never do. And my message to those folks, if only I'd been around in their day, would have said, if you really think you can fly, take off from the ground and fly up. If you could do that, I'm absolutely reasonably satisfied you can probably land safely as well so but the, <laughs> they didn't have that much um you know or you know again or another met another couple categories of ethical you know let's try crossing a human with a pig you know if you actually created a living creature that really combined the chromosomes of a human and a pig giving significant x uh characteristics of both there is something genuinely blasphemous about such an experiment so yeah there's going to be some things that science that religion will object will object to in science because it's just the heart and soul of what it is to have an ethical base science doesn't ask what's right or wrong it asks what's possible that's its nature that's its purpose religion asks what's right what's wrong and why anyway so, let's see here. So that's the only place you get real limitations, you know, of science by religion is where there's ethical considerations. Now, but in this story, all these religions are joining ecumenical hands, getting behind this one guy named Otis Eldridge. Okay as the voice of all the religions saying, you'll be damned, and you bring on damnation. Well, okay, there's a good paragraph that comes really early in the story. And, in fact, it has some interesting features to it. I'm going to read this paragraph in full. Okay, 
right on the very first page here. So, and it goes like, oh, I see here. I'll, I'll introduce it here. What do they say? What are they? Are they calling the vengeance of God down upon me again? His voice dripped with bitter sarcasm. They're going a little farther now, boss. As listen to this, I read the article. Tomorrow is the day of John Harmon's attempt at profaning the heavens. Tomorrow, in defiance of world opinion and world conscience, this man will defy God. Since when is it up to, to the world, the secular fallen world, and the power of which the devil? lies in the power of the devil, you know, to decide what God would approve of. But okay, I'll stop my comment. Let's get back to the article. It is not given a man to go wheresoever ambition and desire lead him. There are things forever denied him, and aspiring to the stars is one of these. Like Eve, John Harmon wishes to eat of the forbidden fruit, and like Eve, he will suffer due punishment therefore. But it is not enough, this mere talk. If we allow him thus to brook the vengeance of God, the trespass is mankind's and not Harmon's alone. In allowing him to carry out his evil designs, we make ourselves accessory to the crime, and divine vengeance will, vengeance will fall upon all of us alike. It is therefore essential that immediate steps be taken to prevent Harmon from taking off in his so-called rocket ship tomorrow. The government, in refusing to take such steps, may force violent action. If it will take no move, to confiscate the rocket ship or to imprison Harmon, our enraged citizenry may have to take matters into their own hands. At that point, the newspaper ripped out of the reader's hands. <laughs> I find it astonishing that this does reflect a time when it was considered reasonable and appropriate in publications, newspapers, and so forth, meant for the general public to actually encourage people taking the law in their own hands to engage in basically what would amount to a lynch mob, to actually encourage that. I mean, that is unthinkable today, and a good cause. But, I, you know, in 1939, I guess that was considered acceptable. Lynching certainly took place a lot, um, oftentimes for racist reasons. <laughs> and there was a lot of people who was considered acceptable in the 1930s and before. Yeah, go figure, huh? So, people were strange. But there was nothing about wanting to um, stop people from going into outer space. It's just, it'll never work. You know, not, it's going to call down the wrath of God. In this story, that is, of course, the main problem. A crowd is gathered around this rocket ship, and um, one of uh, John Harmon's own people, well, there's, there's a few people to introduce in all of this here. John Harmon is the main guy. It's his fortune that more than anything else has financed this project, but other scientific institutions have definitely contributed to this. Um, there's a Howard Winrad who makes one last intervention. Look, just, you know, I believe in science too. I really do, but maybe if you could just Put this off for a little while, and, and maybe it won't be such a problem, you know? And the guy says, no, screw you, get on your way. Then there's another, well, Otis Eldridge I've already introduced. Um, it is told by a narrative a narrator whose name in the story is Clifford McKenney. One has to read a bit to find his name, but it's there. Cliff or Clifford Man Man McKenney. And it's kind of interesting, as he's telling this whole narrative, there's a paragraph where he's saying this to those of us in the 21st century. And uh, let's see here. However, the masses didn't take it that way. It seems strange, perhaps to you, 21st century. Hey, he's talking to us, you know. But perhaps we should have expected it in those days of 73. That's 1973. People weren't very progressive then. For years, there had been a swing towards religion. And when the churches came out unanimously against Harmon's Rocket, well, there you were. Well, I think we all know what 1973 was really like, or for that matter, how the moon launch actually happened. Uh, I find it interesting that when he decides to do his launch, 
Um, the, the original launch, it was in uh, July. Let's see if I can find the date of Yeah, July 15th. That's not too far from what day of July 1969, the actual first, well, Man on the Moon launch took place. So, that's not too bad. He's off by four years, you know, and, and a handful of, you know, maybe a, a day or two. <sighs> Amazing. So, he, uh, he tries to do that, and there's another person among his group called Shelton. He doesn't seem to have a first name that I can find. Shelton's role in all of this was relatively minor, except that he was also a saboteur and had done something to rig the engines so that instead of taking off, it would explode. And so that's why all those, you know, between people dying and people getting injured, it looks like they actually gave count of 101 people, one get one or the other, including obviously the police officer who said, no, there's no need to stand back, no matter what he says. They didn't stand back and they were in the blast radius of an exploding rocket. Well, that's the picture we saw on the on the, the front of the story. So then it just got stronger and tighter. Um, never mind the obvious fact that the only people who got punished by any vengeance, if you want to call it divine or what, were those outside the rocket standing around and not standing back as they were warned. John Harmon is only minimally injured, goes into a hospital, but mostly for bruises and just minor stuff. Apparently, the part of the rocket that holds him soft lands in some bushes somewhere, so it, it's, it's not harmed. He's not significantly harmed. So he's in a hospital some way, and at some point, Cliff Clifford actually sneaks into the hospital, smuggles him out, and brings him to a whole other state. This takes place in New Jersey, by the way. New Jersey, we we'll figure. Okay. And brings him out to Minnesota. Okay. And secretly, John Harmon, now still having some funds left, not anything like before, and scrounging what little he can, again builds another rocket. In 1978, he is ready to launch this rocket. And he does it so much in secret that nobody knows. But this pendulum, ah, uh, yeah, you get these societal pendulums sometimes. Yeah, there are kind of some, some degree of pendulums um, in society in terms of fads. I mean, you look at the history of, you know, America. There's times when we kind of lean towards one party, sometimes for decades that stretch, and then we lean towards a different party for however long. And it, it's kind of swung back and forth, and <clears throat> that's that's just a reality. So apparently the idea was that after World War One, um, for some reason people were very cynical and science thrived. After World War Two, for some reason, um, people got a lot more strict about all this stuff. And it, it, in fact, after his explosion in 1973. You have all these laws being set up. I mean, Congress, you know, unanimously passes these laws about restricting science to specific subjects. The Supreme Court even upholds it, you know, well, you know, five four ruling, but they you know that was that was enough of a majority to uphold this thing that oh no, any science that's not approved of can't be done. So no one's gonna be building any rockets ever as far as that law concerns, or at least so long as the law's on the books. But, of course, John Harmon, Minnesota, goes ahead anyway. So, it's getting kind of bad. It's getting kind of tight and horrible. People are already starting to suffer from having um, no real um, scientific progress and things that could have helped us, and, you know, feeding more people, medical advancement, blah, 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 because of Oh, there's this no science allowed anymore. Practically. I wonder if they've ever allowed the science of, like, weapons of war, because there's always a lot of money behind that. Somehow they kind of look the other way when it comes to that. 
how about the science of developing a bomb that could blow up a whole city? Now, if you want to find just the technology for its own sake, which were, let's say, something useful, or let's say maybe uh, vaporizing an asteroid that's going to collide with the Earth, you know, something like that, it could be a useful thing. And indeed, the first atomic explo explosion was done in New Mexico in a desert far away. And, well, okay, you probably killed a few million lizards and bats and birds and, you know, other and cactuses and other whatever you find out in a desert somewhere, you know. But there were no human beings. There weren't even animals. I mean, like farm animals, no cows, pigs, horses, anything like that, you know, anywhere near that, that first atomic explosion. But you are building something that would, in its very next detonation, kill innocent people, you know, not just battle, you know, combatants. I mean, in a war, you can, combatants can fight combatants. When you're fighting non-combatants, you know, the way, the wives, the children, uh, you know, and so forth, the other citizens of the country, there's some, there is something morally wrong with that. As most religions, including mine, as nostalgia Catholic, after all, you know, would have to say that is wrong. But that doesn't necessarily mean even the creation of a nuclear bomb would have to bid for that purpose. So that's kind of a gray area. Um, so he's gone ahead. He's done this launch. And he gets back. He figures they'll probably hang him. Now, the second, there's an interesting detail, which I find interesting, which I find really neat. Uh, let me just show one other picture that is in the story and let me tell a little bit of the story behind the picture. He was going to go to the moon. He was going to walk around on the moon. And he had a spacesuit, even all designed for that. Here's a picture of somebody in a spacesuit on what is obviously meant to be the moon. Yeah, they always picture the moon would have high mountains like that instead of the soft, curry, domey type mountains that we actually found when we got there. But that was always pictured. Well, I don't know whether that's just an editorial mistake. Hey, we're talking about a trip to the moon. Let's picture somebody on the moon. Or whether that's supposed to be the intention the guy had and would have done in the first rocket. The second rocket is smaller, simpler, cheaper. It's all he can do just to go around the moon, take a single orbit around the back of it, take some pictures of the back side of the moon and make drawings or whatever else, and maybe, possibly, hopefully, one in ten chance, I'm surprised it's really that good, but he does make it, so whatever the odds were, he made it, back home and somehow managed to land softly on the Earth somewhere. Which, according to the story, he does. So he makes it back, and he shows, look at this. Here's a picture of what the back of the moon looks like. Now, it is kind of remnant. You know, later on, someday, humanity may do flights where they land on the moon. You know, in a way, kind of anticipating how it was with the Apollos. First, they went around the moon with Apollo 8. And they went around the moon again with Apollo 10. You see? You know, then 11 and 12, they finally landed on the moon. And actually, Apollo 13, well, okay, they had problems, although the way they flew probably comes the closest to what it did because those other Apollos actually went into an orbit around the moon for a while and stayed there a while and did some stuff before blasting back towards Earth. Well, 13 couldn't even do that. They just went around the back of it and used the gravity of the moon to swing around and come back and just barely make it back alive. You know, we all know the famous Apollo 13 movie that portrays that very well and with a very high degree of accuracy. So, but the actual walk on the moon doesn't take place. So the drawing is either misleading or it's a portrayal of the dream or intent of the man rather than his accomplishment. So, let's see, what else have we got here? Um... So, Igris is amazing. <laughs> Ignorance is amazing. Somehow. I mean, fanaticism can be ignorant in some ways. But he gets back, and the amazing thing was, his own surprise was, he gets back, and instead of being hung as somebody who dared go through the skies, it was like the time was ripe for the pendulum to start swinging the other way. 
because he made it to the moon, he made it back, he even brought back some interesting pictures of the far side of the moon, you know, obviously he needed to get out, land, and walk around, but, you know, he was to the moon, and did something that you cannot do without going to the moon, and so that means it was a success, he didn't die, humanity didn't get destroyed, it's all right. No harm, no foul. And suddenly the whole, you know, you know, it's just the whole idea of a, oh, some sort of a pseudo-religious fanaticism against space travel is, is that. Well, that's what I have to say. One tiny bit of history. This is a remake of my original review of this third story of Isaac Asimov's. When I originally made it, I did not yet have find or manage to procure a copy of the magazine itself. Now that I finally have it, I've decided I've always known that if ever I found it, I would redo this particular installment. Now I've done that. Thanks for listening.